Good morning. Welcome to worship with Arlington Congregational Church. We are delighted and honored that you've joined us today. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome. If you are here for the first time, we especially want to welcome you, and we hope you will take a moment and check in to let us know you are here, along with everyone else. Please check in and let us know your worshiping with us this morning. As we begin worship, we want to lift up for you that uh, if there are prayers you would have us add to our prayer list, we invite you to do that. Uh, on a pastoral note on that, I learned yesterday that one of our members, Bill Morris, is uh, in the hospital. And so we want to add him to our prayers this morning as we pray for his recovery. Again, as we begin, our mission moment this morning is to lift up that this is HIV and AIDS Awareness Week. And one of our mission connections as a church is with the Northeast Florida World AIDS Day, which is an organization that promotes education and prevention, that hosts an annual World AIDS Day service to remember those whose lives were affected or who have been infected with HIV or AIDS. And so that is each December 1st of each year. Keep all those who are working with those with that or who are affected or infected with HIV or AIDS in your prayers as well this morning. Next week, we will celebrate Holy Communion. And again, as we are still virtual, we invite you to be prepared at home. Again, we remind you that we believe that it is God that makes what we do holy. And so whatever elements you choose to use are welcome. And we invite you to be prepared for that next Sunday, first Sunday in September. We are planning at this time to reopen to face-to-face -face worship on September 20th, we will be observing precautions like masks. We ask you to bring one or we will have them available. And we also have a few of the full face uh, clear shields that help if you are not comfortable wearing a mask. We will observe six foot in distancing and we will uh, have a, ushers here to help guide you on places to sit and be prepared for that. More news will be coming as we get closer, but we want to keep that in your thinking as we prepare for worship this morning. Again, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here in worship with us. So let us worship God together.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on the name of the Lord, make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord, sing praises to God, tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in the Lord's holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, his miracles and the judgments God uttered. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Let us worship God together. Our first song this morning is all hail the power of Jesus' name. Our time of prayer and again if you have not been able to get the names of everyone in we will include those in our coming week of prayers please join me in the spirit of prayer God of creation and creator of all that is hear us as we praise you and pray to you Remind us of your many names revealed in Scripture. Yahweh, you are. Emmanuel, with us. Holy One, whose love is everlasting. Judge, who calls for all to be treated rightly. Love, who calls us to be the living presence of you and of your love here in our world. We confess, O oh God, we are not always loving. We do not always honor you or your creation or our fellow creatures. We do not always do what is righteous and just, and we do not always seek it. For others. Forgive us. Turn our hearts. Open our ears and eyes to hear the pain and suffering of others, and to act to heal, and to bless, and to redeem, as you have redeemed us. We give thanks, O oh God, for you are merciful and compassionate, abounding in steadfast love. 
And you have spoken through your Son, Jesus, to remind us that all who labor and are heavy laden can come to you and find rest and renewal for our lives. Lord Jesus, we seek to give our lives to you. Help us to understand what it means to take up our cross, to follow you, and grant us the courage and faith to do so. Lift our eyes and our hearts to the vision you gave us of God's reign and grant us the imagination to believe and to seek to build it with you. Remind us, O oh Lord, that unless we lift the cross of others, we will never be able to lift our own. But together we can lift every burden, redeem every life, and transform our world to more fully reflect the words we pray on earth as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, we are weak. We are weary. We are worn out by fussing and fighting with our siblings. Soothe our brow. Calm our fears. Teach us truth and grant us the courage to believe it, to trust it, and to bring it into being for all. Turn us from turning on anyone who speaks lies and help us to pray for them that they may be saved and so we too may be saved. Hear us as we pray for all of these things, we ask, and as we pray for those on our hearts this day as well. May your comfort and encouragement be with Dottie and Connie, with Virginia and Chris, we pray for Larry and Gretchen. We pray your healing with all those in need, and especially with Donna, Winston, with Ron. Hear us as we lift up Janice and Jerry. We pray for Darlene for Ephraim, for Bill, and for Jordan. And we, we continue to pray your blessings on Ellie and all those who are celebrating new life, new hope, and new joy. Hear us not only in these prayers, hear us in the prayers that you know in our hearts. Hear us as we pray all this in the name and to the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Thank you, Sally. That was a beautiful piano piece, and we appreciate so much your sharing that with us. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord as we share our scripture lesson this morning, reading from the Gospel of Matthew, 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned to him and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here ends this portion of the Holy Scriptures. Let us give thanks to God for the word of the Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh God, help us not only to have ears to hear, or minds to understand, or hearts to believe, but grant us lives to serve, to carry crosses, and to follow you. Be with us in these moments that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. I became a crossword puzzle fan back when I first moved to Jacksonville in May of 1999. I lived here for six weeks or so before the family moved down, living alone with no television or furniture other than a mattress to sleep on. I would go home and do the Times Union daily crossword puzzle in evenings to kill time. I really haven't kept that habit up in recent years. Crossword puzzles can be entertaining. Crosswords, angry words, to be more accurate, between friends or family or even strangers, are not entertaining. Rather, they can be painful embarrassing or destructive to a relationship. This morning, we hear crosswords between Jesus and Peter, and we hear crosswords from Jesus, words about taking up our cross, those words we so rarely want to think about. If anyone want to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Such cross words are no easier to hear or swallow than the angry words we might be hearing these days between friends, family, or strangers. This morning I want to think mostly about the latter two types of cross words I spoke of the kinds of crosswords that we may say to one another, the crosswords of 
Jesus about our lives, and maybe not so much about crossword puzzles, but maybe that'll come up again too. I believe our response to the words that Jesus spoke, the cross words, may also have an impact on how we respond to so many of the cross or angry words we hear or maybe are saying ourselves in our current cultural crises. So Jesus rather bluntly and suddenly tells his friends that some of the powerful religious and community leaders, elders, chief priests, scribes, are going to have him arrested, beaten, killed. Evidently, these words shocked, maybe even angered Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends. He cannot imagine such a thing. Although it was not uncommon in those days for those in power to execute anyone for the least little thing. The Roman version of peace was a law and order kind that put down any protesting rioting, or threat to the status quo. They did this with the largest army in the world, spread out over Caesar's far-flung empire. The Jewish religion had inspired many revolts against Caesar, who often violated their sacred beliefs by his actions, his words, and his rulings. Ultimately, Jesus was seen as nothing more than one more easily disposed of agitator against Roman power and rule. I know most of us may wish that politics and religion don't mix. We may believe it doesn't. We may wish all we had to think about were spiritual things like love, and peace, and being nice. But the reality is the vision that Jesus Christ preached was a vision of a different way of running the world, this world. And that ultimately always involves politics. Many writers have pointed out that the religious leaders of Jesus' faith and his time enjoyed their positions because the Roman governor and emperor allowed them to as long as they kept the peace at all costs. While many claim Jesus did not talk about politics or social issues, the fact is that any mention of a kingdom of God was a threat to the kingdom of Caesar in Caesar's eyes. And Caesar and Pilate and the chief priests treated it that way. Most of Jesus' parables had to do with the unequal and unjust working conditions in his time. One writer points out that Jesus, as the, quote, King of the Jews, or God's Christ, God's Messiah, God's Anointed One, is obviously a threat to the status quo. His mere existence as an infant was such a threat to King Herod, who served only as long as he pleased Caesar, that the scriptures tell us Herod was willing to murder all the children under two years old around Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth to be sure that Jesus would not someday take Herod's crown. Herod knew he could rely on the chief priests and scribes to cooperate with his murderous agenda because they too only served as long as they kept Pilate as governor and thus Caesar happy. Just like then, in every age, there are those who use religion to manipulate politics and politics to manipulate religion. 
This may be a concept we would rather not consider. We may wish it was not part of our spiritual life. But here's the reality. What Jesus really was doing and asking us to consider are things the way they really should be? Are we living the fullness of the kingdom of God, the reign of God's love? Can you and I not imagine a better alternative to what is now? I have in the past suggested that faith is an act of imagination, a visioning of God's purpose for the creation, for humanity, and for the future. When Peter demands Jesus not die, he is in a sense saying that's something he can't imagine happening or being God's will. Let me share what another writer, a theologian and preacher, said. Perhaps that's the difficulty. Peter couldn't imagine. He couldn't imagine that Jesus had come not just to comfort people, but to free them. Comforting isn't that hard. Just give them a little more of what they already have and tell them everything will be all right. Freedom is different. Freedom requires that they see that what they have isn't life-giving in the first place. And that's as true for the oppressor as the oppressed. The writer goes on to say the evidence is all around us. We know people are dying. We know the world is scary and disappointing as it is and that we have settled for less than God hopes. Disappointing relationships, the illness that returns, the career that ended too soon, the untimely death mourned, the disappointment looming. Even worse, we see the chaos, the violence, unwarranted shootings on an almost daily basis. And we think our task is either to take the side of law and order and the police because we believe our very way of life is threatened, or we think there isn't anything to do but blow everything up to change it. Isn't there something really different? Isn't there something more I believe Jesus promises more. It's a different more than the more we have led, been led to believe will satisfy us. Our scriptures this morning echo the temptations Jesus himself faced and overcame. If you think back to those, let me share what another writer said. Think about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The devil dared Jesus to save his life by turning stones into bread so that he could eat. To lose his life by casting himself down off the highest point of the Temple Mount so God's angels would save him. And to gain the world while forfeiting his life because Satan promised him all the kingdoms of the world in exchange for worshiping Satan. Jesus settled the question of his priorities. He sided with the poor who do not have the power to turn stones into bread. He refused to trivialize life and sided with those who were defenseless from the daily onslaught of violence. He knew they did not have angels who would pick them up from the top of the temple fall. He turned down ill-gotten material prosperity and power predicated on participating with evil and oppressive forces. 
these were the choices Jesus made. This is what took him to the cross. To me, this is the difference between the way God thinks and we humans often think. Perhaps we can best take up our cross by working to stop the crucifixion of others. To me, following Jesus means I cannot be satisfied with the way things are when my sisters and brothers are suffering. I have to imagine something different, something better. So let me try to be less controversial. Let me try a metaphor, maybe a parable. Stay with me here. For those of us who are at least curious about the start of football in the fall, let alone those of us who are anxious for it, maybe this will work. There was once a cornerback, one of those people who cover the wide receivers. He had been through years of coaching and training to cover those receivers, to make split-second decisions about which direction to go, whether to play bump and run, or lay back and cover loose. He was lined up in the Super Bowl to cover a receiver. And every indication from all the training he had was to play that receiver close because he might run for a touchdown. But the receiver made a move the cornerback didn't expect. And so he grabbed the receiver to keep him from getting away. Yes, and he was called for pass interference, a 15-yard penalty. Oh, the next play, the same receiver scored a touchdown because that cornerback was still upset about how the receiver had deceived him on the last play. Some in the crowd booed the cornerback. So much fun. Some yelled that the receiver had committed offensive pass interference. Oh my God. <coughs> Some who thought about it realized maybe the coach had not given the cornerback all the training and preparation he needed to be successful. We're having a sometimes violent debate about policing in our nation. Some think anyone who complains hates the police. Some think it is all the fault of those who get shot in the back for not obeying the police. What if at least part of the answer is not hating, but better training, better coaching, if you will? So rather than just ignore the problems or blame someone I think is at fault, I want to suggest there are solutions to a better way. There are solutions for each problem if we're willing to work together to find them. What if, and this is no parable, can you imagine if we gave training, better training to police to help them respond, even in split second decision making moments, so that they automatically had a choice that was better than killing someone who maybe is actually not guilty of a death sentence crime. Or in a way that gets the officer killed. None of us wants that. The call for a solution to problems is why I am deeply invested in our justice ministry mission as a pastor. Our justice ministry networks look for solutions that work. It's why I push for our church to be invested in this work. Our justice ministry has researched an effective, better training alternative 
than what our police force here locally currently uses. It is a training that helps to reduce the violence and encounters when there is a mental health crisis involved. This training has worked in many other large cities. In Miami, Florida, for instance, a city that during the 1980s was ripped by violence and police shootings, many of which were considered a sign of racial bias and prejudice. But they've implemented this training. Over a six year period, the statistics show that because of this training, over 70,000 people who came in contact with police officers who were dealing with mental health issues, instead of being arrested or worse, shot because something escalated, they found alternatives, whether that was inpatient, outpatient, or simply resolving the situation without the need for an arrest. That's 70,000 of God's children whose lives were saved. Less than two-tenths of those who were identified as having potential mental health crises had to be arrested over a six-year period. Others received either appropriate treatment or the situation was de-escalated where the officers did not have to take action. Is that not a God thing? Is that not an alternative to, as Jesus rebuked Peter, the way humans so often think? Is, not a, is that not a way? To not just carry our cross, but to lift someone else's by supporting this kind of change? Why would we not want to provide better training for our police? Just a thought for your imagination this morning. So here's a crossword puzzle for you this morning. What's a seven letter word for faith. Imagine. What is a phrase for the opposite of a worse? Right. A better. What is a three letter word for what the early followers of Jesus called their religion? You got it. Way. Put that together, and what do you have? Imagine a better way. Imagine a better world. Imagine working together for it. Imagine. Amen. Please pray with me once more. O oh God of grace and mercy, God of power and love, take our cross words and turn us to a new imagination, to a new world, to a new faith, that we may lift the cross of others and in so doing, truly bow down before you, honor you, crown you, king of our lives, king of our world. In all these things we pray, through the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
And now may the King of creation be with you, that you may be inspired with an imagination for the new world that God is bringing, that God envisions, and that God calls us to join in and be part of. Let us imagine a new world from this time forth and forevermore. Amen and amen.